hospitality. <coughs> Reading from Bhagavad Gita, chapter 18, verse 65. <coughs> Vandana Baba Magsako, Ajati Nam Namaskar, Rajivashi Sishapyante, Pratitane Namaskar. First two lines of this verse are identical, with an apparently very similar verse in the ninth chapter. Difference being that <clears throat> in the ninth chapter, Lord Krishna is speaking about his devotees' love for him. In this chapter, Krishna is very freely opening his heart to the truth of his love for his devotees, <clears throat> performed by his devotees. <laughs> the most confidential part of knowledge is that one should become a pure devotee of Krishna and always think of him and act for him. One should not become an official meditator. Life should be so molded that one would that one will always have the chance to think of Krishna. One should always act in such a way that in all his daily activities are in connection with Krishna. He should arrange his life in such a way that throughout the 24 hours he cannot but think of Krishna. And the Lord's promise is that anyone who is in such pure Krishna consciousness will certainly return to the abode of Krishna, or he will be engaged in the association of Krishna face to face. This most confidential part of knowledge is spoken to Arjuna because he is the dear friend of Krishna. Everyone who follows the path of Arjuna can become a dear friend to Krishna as well and obtain the same perfection as Krishna. <clears throat> In Bhagavad Gita, Many <clears throat> paths are described. Karma yoga, jnana yoga, vastanga yoga, bhakti yoga. <clears throat> and because it's impossible for Krishna, he may reveal, but who can assimilate all his teachings at once? So at any particular stage in our devotional life, Sri Guru may emphasize certain instructions to be later superseded by other and possibly, apparently, contradictory instructions. Some feel that Bhagavad Gita suggests different paths as <clears throat> commonly heard in India and elsewhere, that all, path, all spiritual paths lead ultimately to the same goal. <clears throat> Bhagavad Gita reveals higher and lower conclusions. And here, in this verse, Krishna is presenting the very essence of Bhagavad Gita. The final word, the conclusion. 
which sums up the essence of Krishna consciousness, as Srila Prabhupada explained it, which is to always remember Krishna and never forget him. And in this verse, not this verse, next verse, <coughs> complementing the same theme, Sarva Dharma Pratyata, Mamikam Shananam Draja. This verse is so often taken to be the conclusion of Bhagavad Gita, but it's really the consequence of the previous verse. Always remember Krishna. Then you can surrender all the varieties of religion, duty, obligation. Sharanam Raja. Sharanam means to take complete shelter of the Sharanagata, the pure devotee. And Raja here is used as a verb, which is related to the noun, the place. It means take shelter in this context. Where? In the place where pure love resolves all apparent contradictions. Because there in Braj, Krishna is the center of everything and everyone. <coughs> There is a parallel conversation in Krishna and Arjuna's encore appearance in Chaitanya Lila as Lord Chaitanya in Ramananda Rai, where <coughs> Krishna is testing his student Arjuna in the form of Mahaprabhu asking questions of Ramananda Rai, wherein the most commonly accepted version of Bhagavad Gita's conclusion is taken to a whole new level. Very emphatically glorifying the love of God. <coughs> And in the following verses, Sri Krishna explains who is most dear to him. Those who share this supreme secret with others. Not that there's anything secret about Bhagavad Gita. But this refers to drawing out the deepest meaning, which can only be done by one who is free of ulterior motives and is serving others with a central desire to please Krishna. <clears throat> this verse, this is two verses, which awarded to Arjun the fearlessness, the conviction, the focus to wage war, which he was so reluctant to do seeing his relatives, friends, teachers, gurus on the other side. That's an extreme dilemma. And in Krishna's words granted that enlightenment that he could see the larger spiritual picture. <clears throat> the longer we live, the more opportunities we will find to 
to surrender to the temptation to think that life has cheated us. <clears throat> and therefore, we might become cynical, discouraged, potentially even bitter. And if we're attentive to the deeper voices speaking within our hearts, there's always that option. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted, combined with the most reassuring words of all. My grace is sufficient for you. <clears throat> urging us above and beyond counting our blessings to cultivate a sense of gratitude. And in a spirit of gratitude, which changes the way we look at things, which changes the things we see. It's not being very popular law of attraction is just being attentive to the good within and around us all, all times increasing that by the power of our thoughts and concentration which will attract more of the same into our lives <clears throat> the sequence of the events in our misfortune is summarized in very simplified form in the famous allegory in Genesis, the Garden of Eden, where <clears throat> the first created beings, Adam and Eve, live very peacefully and happily in a garden which is which produced everything. for their complete satisfaction. The only condition was just avoid the forbidden apple. Now this apple didn't necessarily grow on an apple tree, it might have grown on a Google tree, <laughs> which for some reason God placed right in the middle of the garden. And what is so attractive about the forbidden apple? It's the invitation to express our rebellious nature. And then, you know, I'm not referring to the Bible as a pure scripture, although it is filled with many revelations, which Sri Prabhupada appreciated and oftentimes used in his own preaching. But look at the sequence of events. And the biblical version is very simple, which helps simple people to understand. From the initial life of eternity, knowledge, and bliss, as soon as Eve, seduced by the, tempted by the serpent, and of course to really appreciate it, you have to understand something of Hebrew culture. Because the reason they were forbidden to eat from the forbidden apple is because then you would know <coughs> good and evil. Well, that sounds like a good thing to have the discretion to discern good from evil. It's actually essential. So that can be confusing if you don't know the culture. In that culture, to know means to actually experience. So to know good and evil means to experience good and evil, which is what happened. And Eve tasted forbidden fruit. 
And then look at the sequence of events from a life of eternity, knowledge, and bliss. Very confident, very happy, very peaceful in the Lord's protection. And the bounty of the earth. All of a sudden, shame set in. And they realized that they weren't properly clothed. So then, after shame came fear to such an extreme as when they heard the Lord approaching, they heard his footsteps approaching, and he called out to them. They hid. They were afraid. Fear, fear, shame, and then the whole series of trials and traumas that followed. <clears throat> Srimad Bhagavatam gives a very elaborated version. But rather than go back to Genesis, we can fast forward to an example of the potency of these Bhagavad Gita verses and the sequence that followed in Arjuna's journey. <coughs> Empowered, inspired by Lord Krishna's singing the Bhagavad Gita, Arjuna won the battle of Kurukshetra. And that was part of the sequence of events in Lord Krishna's appearance. Because God is booming being so aggrieved by the torments inflicted by unrighteous so-called kings and leaders, simply tormenting the people and torturing the earth. She prayed to Brahma. He took her to Hiradaksha Vishnu. He escorted them up a effulgent celestial waterway. through the coverings of the universe, left by the toe in front of Lord Brahma, which allowed the waters of the causal ocean to flow into this world. Penetrating that immense darkness, crossing over the coverings of the universe, the devas, led by Kirilaksha Vishnu, were next blinded by the Brahma Yoga, which Srila Prabhupada explains is the curtain of Yoga Maya, concealing the word behind. And they crossed over that, they saw Anantashesh, the jewels on his head being the source of that Brahma Yoga. He proceeded further, ultimate, and you know, seeing all the universes in this world like insignificant bubbles in the Karma Ocean, of which our universe is the smallest. Then in the Brahma Jyoti, seeing innumerable Vaikuntha planets. And Sri Vishnu took them right to Goloka Vrindavan, where they made their appeal to Krishna to descend, and he did. His plan to relieve the tormented earth began in his childhood by annihilating all the demons sent by Kamsa. Whereas later, it was fulfilled largely by the Pandavas. And the Battle of Kurukshetra was an arrangement to bring The demoniac forces, far and wide, to assemble them, mainly the Korvas at that particular time, to liberate them. <coughs> so 
so, I mean, he did the same thing in, in the Torah. And I always... <clears throat> Letting Jarvis under attack so many times, 18 total, after which every time he assembled more demoniac supporters from more of the world and brought them all to Krishna's doorstep in the Torah to be liberated. <clears throat> after the Battle of Kurukshetra, Krishna was contemplating that there's still another potential major disturbance to the earth awaiting. And that is his own dynasty, the Jadavas. Who for various reasons could become the next challenge. One is that we experience, practically speaking, in our own relationships, familiarity can, it doesn't have to, but it may lead to contempt. And therefore, by etiquette, that's emphasis on respect and humility is essential for our protection. <clears throat> the Jadu dynasty had grown so powerful the Krishna was thinking that when I leave, the madness of separation may inspire them to go wild, uncontrollable. So, as one of the final chapters in his past, times, he had to relieve the earth of that upcoming birth. So, you know, it began with, you know, inauspicious omens in Dwarka. And Krishna said, well, we should go to Prabhakshetra to perform sacrifice to counteract these ill omens. And, and you know, the Jadus all went along with it, but Uddhava could see that that's not the real reason for his taking this there. Because how can there be inauspiciousness in Krishna's holy dham during his presence? So Uddhava understood, and he could find it in Krishna openness, there's another reason for going. And that was the aftermath or the following series of events from when the Jadus actually began to manifest the symptoms of that disease, familiarity, reads contempt, in Samba, Krishna's own son through Jambabhati. With his young Jadu prince friends, frivolously and mischievously decided to play a trick on the sages. He dressed Stamba up as a young lady with a big hump on his belly, took him or her or whatever before the sages and mocked him or feigning false humility, they said, oh, great sages, you're so enlightened. This lady is too shy to express herself before you, so we're speaking on her behalf. She would like to know if her child will be a boy or a girl. And the sages replied, it'll be neither. She will give birth to an iron club that will be the annihilation of your whole dynasty. The boys were terrified. They ran to Maharaj Ugrasena's assembly hall. Well, first of all, when he took off his sari, so sure enough, there was an iron club in Samba's belly. So they took it before King Ugrasena. And then he became terrified. <laughs> the emperor of the Jada dynasty terrified because he knew the consequences of Vaishnava Parada. So he ground the club into powder, but there was one little piece that could not be pulverized. 
Maharaj Ugrasena himself took the powder and the little piece left into the ocean, cast it into the water. But you can't avoid the consequences of Vaishnava Parad. The water washed the iron filings to the shore where it grew up into something like what we would call here cattails. Not the fluffy part, the blade part. And the piece that couldn't be pulverized was swallowed by a fish. Later caught by a fisherman who found the piece of iron inside and gave it to Jara, the hunter, which he could easily form into an arrowhead. <clears throat> so <laughs> when Krishna is leading the Jadus to Prabhakshetra, it was for his final mission of relieving the earth of her upcoming torment in his own dynasty. <clears throat> so there at Prabhakshetra, when the Jadus became intoxicated, they took those blades of grass and began striking each other, not initially knowing that the blades of grass were blades of iron. And they nearly, almost completely, annihilated one another. So in the vast field of carnage, Daruka, Krishna's charioteer, a very confidential associate of the Lord, Seeking out Krishna and Balaram, blinded by tears, he could only follow the fragrance of the Tulsi Manjus, which he knew would take him to Krishna's lotus feet. And there he saw the arrow, which had not actually pierced, but touched Krishna's lotus feet. And he saw Jara so bitterly repentant. And Krishna consoled him. This is destiny. Because you were previously Bhrigu Muni, who place your feet on Vishnu's chest, and this is the reaction. But don't worry, because by my presence and blessings will be free from all reactions and liberated. So Taruka is watching this scene and hearing celestial voices. He looks up and he sees Krishna's horses, which means his own service, is gone. Krishna's horses, his chariot, his weapons, rising into the sky. Meaning they're going back to Vaikuntha before the Lord, and, and you realize this is the beginning of the end. <clears throat> and he was so, I mean, there's no words to express the depth of his grief that Krishna's leaving. And Krishna told him, be peaceful and go. Be peaceful? Continue. We will meet again in another place. Krishna imparted to Daruka his remaining mission in this world on behalf of Krishna, which is why he and a few others, including Uddhava, Arjuna, did not perish in that massacre. So Uddhava could not, I mean, Daruka could not leave Krishna except by the force of Yoga Mai, which dragged him something like a calf away from Mother Cow back to the island, Dwarka, <clears throat> where he threw himself at the feet 
The Vasudeva Devaki and Rohini, and through bitter sobs, he explained what happened. And then they ran to Prabhakshetra, along with the other remaining Jadus of Dwaraka. And there, searching through the carnage, was mo mothers looking for their sons, children looking for their father. Devaki, Vasudev, Ugrasena, looking for their son, Krishna. And unable to find him, just crying out in such anguish. <clears throat> O oh, Krishna, and there was a moment of peace and calm with the utterance of the holy names, followed by the women, including Devaki and Rohini, and even Vasudeva himself, just embracing the three on fires to leave this world. <clears throat> Meanwhile, back in Dwarka, it was just a matter of days until dark clouds of gloom cast an eerie shadow over the landscape. <clears throat> Arjun was wandering aimlessly like a haunted orphan, just really preoccupied with ending his life, but Daruka continually consoled him and urged him to remember Krishna's instructions. He had a remaining mission, which was to escort Krishna's queens to Indraprastha, where they would live under the shelter of So Arjun focused his mind. And this verse from Bhagavad Gita, which has so much significance to him during the Battle of Kurukshetra, is now gaining in strength and clarity and inspiration as the challenges in his life are ever increasing. He assembled all of Krishna's queens on the mainland, on the shore of Dwarka. And when they assembled, dark clouds overcast the sky, jagged lightning, blasting thunderbolts, and the earth began to tremble so violently as if she was trying to cast off one last oppressor. And then, before the eyes of everyone, the golden city of Dwarka, Krishna's own eternal abode, slipped down beneath the surface of the ocean. And as the sea waters boiled violently, and the queens are just blinded by tears, merging with the downpour of rain, Arjun kept focused because he's remembering Krishna's instructions. He formed them into a caravan, caravan and proceeded to Indraprastha. They didn't go very far until there was a roadblock of what Srila Prabhupada describes as infidel cavalry men who halted Arjuna's caravan and challenged him and physically grabbed, not all, but one group of the queens grabbed them, dragged them into the forest as they're screaming and appealing to Arjuna for shelter and protection. 
and our June, whose prowess never faltered in heaven or earth. He took his Gandiva bow, but he couldn't string it. He somehow didn't have the strength. He called for the other weapons in his arsenal, but they didn't come. He remembered his celestial armory, but he forgot the mantra to invoke it. In seeing all this, these cowherd men are laughing and joking and mocking Arjuna. How could they possibly have known of his sudden impotence? And why? Because Krishna, who is the source of all glory, Morality, victory, opulence had already taken all those things back to the upper cut down, the spiritual sky. How could these infinite coward men have known that? In case we forget, fill you in right now. They were expansions of Krishna. <coughs> Not to take his own wives back home. But Arjun didn't know that at the time. It came much later. So Arjuna finally made it into Prasta. He told his brothers what happened. They all shared their realizations and they left for the north. Traversing high into the Himalayas, following the path of their forefathers, reaching that high elevation with its vegetation that is sparse and the air is so thin, and you're beyond the point of no return where life cannot be sustained. At a certain point, that jagged, rocky path transmuted into a marble walkway. The craggy peaks of the Himalayas transformed into golden domes. And in one palace, for an instant before his eyes were again blinded with tears, and his body shaking in ecstasy, Arjuna saw in one window his dear friend, gazing so lovingly upon him as if to ensure him, remember I told you, Sarvadharma Piritya Manikam Shadanam Puraja. Abandon everything, surrender to me, and you will come to me. I assure you, because my, you are my very dear friend. Therefore do not fear, do not hesitate, do not worry. The Pandavas crossed over into Uppercut Dwarka and beyond, because we know in the life of Raghunath Das Goswami, when he was excavating Shamakund, Maharaj Yudhisthira appeared into a dream and told him, don't cut those five trees because that's me and my brothers performing bhaja in Gracha on the shore of Shamakund. <clears throat> Before leaving, Maharaj Yudhisthira turned over the empire to his grandson, Maharaj Krishna, who in turn posted Vajra, Krishna's grandson, as the king of Mathura. <clears throat> and it wasn't long before Maharaj Krishna came to Mathura to visit Vajra, where by this time the queens, Krishna's queens, were residing. And <clears throat> Vajra received his uncle, not so much as a relative as a Vaishnava with such respect. The Maharaj Priksit assured him, you don't need to have any concern for finance or defense. And Vajra said, I don't. Because I learned the art of warfare from your father, Abhimanyu, I have no concerns with enemies. Finance, you know, everything Matura is flourishing. My concern is outlying grudge, which is desolate. So, where have all the Brijabhasis gone? There was one left, Shandili Muni. Nanda Maharaj's guru, who lived at Gopinath, so they invited him to Matura. 
And he explained that all the bridges of us, you know, they're a combination of the devas from heaven, who Vishnu told to take birth in the Jada dynasty. And amongst the Brijabhasis as well, as Amsas, as portions of the Brijabhasis. Well, they all went back to heaven. The devotees have all been elevated to the spiritual world. Kamsa and the demons have been liberated. So, Braj is desolate. <coughs> and it's Sandilya Muni. Now this is back when Kshatriyas, the kings and emperors, would take guidance from the sages. Sandhya Muni implored them, your foremost duty to your citizens, yourself, and the earth is to restore Brajidam to her previous splendor. Renovate the holy places, beginning with Govardhan and the gods and the kundas. Rename all the villages according to their previous name. <clears throat> and by the blessings of Vrindavan, you will be blessed, and that blessing will culminate in you meeting Buddha. as a reward for your service of unveiling Sri Dham from her covered, concealed condition. So, you know, Mara's tricks and brudge, budge are so enlivened and inspired that Krishna's queens considered, continued to be extremely morose, wanting only to die because of these series of extreme traumas that they've been through. The only exception being Kalindi, who was always jubilant, cheerful. And finally her co-wives asked, what is your secret? And she said, I've learned how to see and remember Krishna in and through everything by the mercy and instructions of Uddhava. So, you can achieve the same goal simply by hearing from Uddhava. And the queens were confused. We were in Dwarka when Krishna dispatched him to Badri Gashra. For what purpose? To reveal the glories of Brajabhakti to the deities and the sages of Adri Gashra and then beyond to the world. So how can we hear from Uddhava? And Kalindi said, Krishna simultaneously in sending him to Badri Gashra fulfilled his desire to become a creeper in Braj for the purpose of being dusted with the Chintamani on the lotus feet of the Brijabhasis and the cows. <clears throat> so this was like the first glimmer of hope in a long series of dismal events in our lives. So, Maharaj Prichet with Vajra and the queens went to Mount Anandara Matura and then they go to Brudge, and they went to Krishna Sarovra, not knowing that to be the residence of Uddhava. Maharaj Pariksha began the kirtan, because Kalindi said that Uddhava will appear if you have kirtan, he likes kirtan, will appear. So Maharaj Pariksha began the kirtan. Vajra opened the royal treasury and offered the queens all the choice of their favorite instruments. So they're playing the accompaniment, responding to the kirtan, Maharaj Krishna had never experienced kirtan like that because of the audience, because of the setting. He just raised his arms to the sky and began dancing through Sri Bhagavan, around Govardhan, coming back to Krishna Sarovra, where, like a mist rising off the water, 
on the distant shore, taking form with saffron hue illumined from within by a golden luster evolved into a person, human, wearing yellow dhoti, looking almost exactly like Krishna. So they all offer their obeisances <clears throat> And it was a very long <clears throat> series of events for their meeting. We'll skip over that because of time constraints. But one important thing to understand is Maharaj Pariksit always had one thing on his mind. He was wondering, what was Krishna thinking when he departed this world? So he asked, who first gazed among the queens, and then he answered, Krishna was thinking of Vidura. Because he alone, amongst all the Kauravas, would not participate in Vaishnava Parad. He would not be part of any offenses. Whatever the great material rewards were offered for doing so. And you can see that in Amara's preaching, he's a little shocked as with the queens. He said, Amara's preaching asked, what about his queens? And he said, he's always thinking of them. You asked, you know, this specific thought at the time of living in this world. So then at the request of Amara's preaching, would you marry a true Ramadan for us? And he said, yes, but you can't be part of it because Kali is preparing his appearance in this world. He will not allow any virtuous activity to be fulfilled without tremendous opposition. This narration can't happen unless you're patrolling the kingdom for the appearance of Kali. Can you imagine how dejected he felt? Maharaj preached it after a glimpse of Krishna within the womb, searching for him throughout his life, is finally so close he can practically embrace him. And Uddhava was dispatching him to hunt down the devil. But he assured him, don't worry. You'll hear Srimad Bhagavatam soon enough. This narration is meant for the queens. It'll echo soon enough in the songs of Shukadeva Goswami, singing personally to you through whom the whole world will have access to Srimad Bhagavatam. So hearing that, he was inspired. He went off and, sure enough, confronted Kali. So Vajra stood guard as Uddhava began to sing. And as he explained Bhagavad philosophy, the queens assimilated all its truths. This is an important thing. Simply hearing philosophy doesn't do you much good if you don't assimilate it. And if you want to know how to do that, read Narada Muni's own explanation of how he became so empowered by hearing from the Bhaktivedanta story. Basically, it was his own good behavior and disciplined in nature, which attracted the blessing. As Uddhava described creation, maintenance, annihilation of the universe, the queens not only heard, but they saw it all unfolding behind, before their very eyes, like a multimedia presentation. When he sang the glories of the holy name, the queens reveled deeply in the sweetness of Sri Nam. And when Uddhava described the various avatars, the queens listening with love, knowing all the avatars to be different manifestations of their beloved Krishna. 
<clears throat> and when you reach the tenth canto, describing Krishna's Vrindavan pastimes, the queen has found their sense of awe, veneration, and selfish ambition. I mean, it was for the pleasure of Krishna, but they wanted to enjoy Krishna. They found that very subtle, selfish nature dissolve into a more sweet and selfless form of love. And there in Vrindavan, hearing Braj Lila, they experienced all the sights and sounds and sensations from of the Shirat Purnim evening. In all of the sequence of events, from the ravishing call of Krishna's flute to the frenzied rush into the forest to the pain of Krishna's initial indifference, to the joy of his embrace, to the anguish of the following separation, to the lament on the shore of Jamuna. Living in the Torah, now reaching Raja, combined with hearing from Uddhava, elevated the queens of Dwarka. Now, now, you know, they're, they're not like old people. They're like, you know, they appear to be 16 to 20 years of age. But they've been through a lot in this lifetime. And all these effects is elevating their consciousness and mood very much in line, very similar to that of the gopis. Not identical, they would always remain queens. But the influences of gopis' sentiments was affecting them so deeply that they could feel and experience the gopis' moods. And then, as the whole scene unfolded before their eyes, the queens found themselves seated amongst the gopis. As they're singing their gopi gita. <clears throat> and as Uddhava sang, Gopi Gita, and the queens were wondering, how does he know the secrets of the Gopi's hearts? Now Uddhava, remember, he's, a, he's the only human disciple of Brihaspati. He learned Srimad Bhagavatam in the celestial version from Brihaspati himself. All of Brihaspati's students are demigods, except Uddhava, he's the only earthling amongst them. And Krishna repeatedly sent him to Raja, thinking that he was a messenger to teach the gopis until he realized that he was a student, their higher form of love. So, <clears throat> so the queens find themselves seated amongst the gopis. Gopis couldn't see the queens, So the queens could see the gopis, and then the queens could see that Krishna is appearing, you know, hiding behind rocks and trees. So the gopis couldn't see Krishna, but the queens could. <clears throat> As they sat beneath that full moon and autumn sky, <clears throat> gopis singing songs of separation, hoping that Krishna would return to them. <clears throat> and the queens could see that Krishna was hiding, coming close, wanting to hear their expressions and see their countenance. <clears throat> and 
And the queen's ecstasy further inspired both Uddhava and Vajra to long, no longer remain satisfied to be. mere spectators, they were drawn into the current of the experience. <clears throat> and <clears throat> while the gopis experienced, when they, when they started to see Krishna, you know, first hiding, then coming out of hiding and interacting with them, the gopis thought it was a spirit, uh, spirit, um, I mean, spurti means a vision, like a hallucination, created of an intense desire and yearning to see Krishna. So they thought, this is a spurti. But the queens could see it's not. And Uddhava and Vajra, they saw this is, we are having direct darshan with Krishna. <coughs> and <coughs> Vajra was making inquiries within his mind to which Krishna would repeat his question for the audience to hear and then Krishna himself would give the answer within their hearts. <clears throat> so when they reached the Oh my Lord, the nectar of your words and the description of your pastimes is the only life and soul for those of us who are aggrieved by life in this material world. These narrations, Krishna Kata, are filled with immense spiritual power, which is broadcast by exalted personalities. Whoever hears such narrations attains all good fortune. And those who spread the message of Godhead are amongst all souls in this world the most magnificent. So then, <clears throat> Krishna began asking questions of the gopis. What is the qualification of these souls you're referring to in distributing Krishna Kata? Who are they? And where do they go? And the gopis re reply that since they're the most magnanimous, they go in everywhere and anywhere and distribute to anyone eternally out of compassion to restore life to those who are nearly dead in this world due to the torments of Maya. <clears throat> And those who hear become as fortunate as those who sing the glories of Krishna. <clears throat> so hearing that, Krishna said, Would you like for me to distribute Krishna Kata to you? Wouldn't that be nice to hear Krishna Kata for me personally in my presence? And one of the senior gopis snapped, No! And the queens were shocked. I never heard of anybody treating their husband like that, which was obviously an expression of extreme, spontaneous, and uncontrollable love. And the queen started shifting uncomfortably and never experienced any such thing. <clears throat> and Krishna asked, why? Why didn't you want to hear Krishna Kata from me? And the gopi said, because it kindles feelings of separation, which is more bitter than death. But it's simultaneously so nectarian, we can't give it up. So, you know, hearing these things, Vajra is spellbound. Uddhava is astonished, and Krishna is enchanted at what he's seeing and hearing. And all the fauna and flora, the sun, the, the sun was down, gone, but the, the moon, the stars, the firmament, they were all so swept up in this narration that they all too entered into the upper country. And the queens, seeing all this, they saw something. 
that in the panoramic vision they're witnessing, they all saw a different Vegas. And that was their eternal goal form, identity, and function. And they crossed over into the Akakat Dham, after which Vajra, he disappeared to resume his eternal form as a thunderbolt on the soul of Krishna's foot. And Uddhava is again all alone in Braja on the shore of Kushan Sarovra, his eternal home. And he loved it. So he bade farewell to all those who had just departed. And where did Krishna go? He set out in search of the voice immersed in Krishna Kata, which he continues to do today. And in Braj, especially at Kushan Zarova, pure Vaishnavas are even those who are aspiring, but are very serious and sincere in their sadhana. They still at times hear the echoes of the gopis' songs crossing over from the upper cut, the unmanifest bomb, and are forever nourished, as we all are, by Oh, my Lord, the nectar of your words and the descriptions of your pastimes, and most of all, the glories of your holy name, are the only life and soul for all of us who are struggling, suffering, tormenting this material world, like all the trauma. Heartbreaks and losses. We are sustained by Krishna Kata and Krishna Nath, which are broadcast by exalted personalities. For us, that is Srila Prabhupada. He not only brought us. Krishna Kata, he invoked Raja here in the hills of Appalachia. So we would have the fullest support to all aspects of our devotional service. So that we could prepare to go home, but most of all, help others to do the same. Shri Prabhupada Ki Jai Gaur Pranamdi Hare Swami Ki Jai Are there any questions or comments? Speaking, there's descriptions of how the Yadu dynasty went, uh, left this world. I've never heard any pastimes of how Nanda Maharaj, your son, Ayi, left. Use your stage voice for the mic. I'm sorry? Use your stage voice. Outside voice. Yeah. Yeah. Outside voice. Stage, stage voice. Maharaj, can you repeat the question? He said he never heard any versions of how Nanda and Jashura left this world. <coughs> it was <coughs> when Krishna returned, and he could say the last time, but he's always coming along from Raja. Do your perspective is final return to Vrindavan, where <clears throat> you know after all 
all your demons that had invaded Vrindavan in for the purpose of killing Krishna. Imagine the anxiety that Mother Jashoda and Nandalaras were feeling. But the cumulative tension of that whole lifetime's experience was incomparable to the greatest threat they ever witnessed, which is the chariot mark the palace gate, symbolizing it. Krishna can leave any time. Mother Mother has made a very big promise he won't leave, but I promise. But that wasn't good enough for Mother to show that. If you promise so many times and you're always leaving, do something practical. I'm like, what? And she was trying to keep it concealed, but she couldn't do it anymore. She blurted out, get married. So that was actually you know, Krishna's biggest challenge of all. How could, because who could he marry other than the Gopis, but they were all married? Anyway, it's a long series of wonderful events. So when Krishna <coughs> agreed to marry, which they, they interpreted as you know, the practical assurance he'll never leave. I mean, that's the reason he didn't get married in the first place. He <laughs> said he couldn't have left Vrindavan. So finally, now that he's come back for the last time, he's going to be married to the And, you know, the fact that they were already married was you know, resolved by Yoga Maya with help from <coughs> Vishnu Shakti, and they were happily married. So then Krishna asked Nanda Maharaj, are you happy now? You know, I've come home, I'm married as you to show to have asked, are you happy now? And Dr. Mara said, no. He said, because you're living with us means that now, us and Dave and Dave with you, we're going to have to suffer your separation. And that transformed my joy in having you here into sorrow because he and I, you know, us and Dave and myself are not different in a sense. So, you know, you've seen so many miracles you perform. If there's any way that you can stay with us and stay with them simultaneously, then I'll be happy. Krishna said, that's no problem. Don't ask me, just command me. And then right before the eyes of Nanda Jashoda, Nanda Nandana, Krishna, expanded into Vasudev Krishna. And he said, well, you know, I'll go back to Dwarka to stay with Vasudev and Devaki. And not that I can stay here. So then not that the Shoda were very happy, but that wasn't Krishna's only miracle for the day. He expanded into another form, and he told Daruga, O oh, master of the horses, expand your chariot, because all of Vrindavasis, not only the humans, but the cows and the deer and the birds and the trees, they're all going to have to get aboard and go home. So, <laughs> Krishna's mystic poems here, the chariot expanded, everybody, including Nanda Dushanta, Boarded the chariot and ascended into the sky. And how did how did Daruka know the way? Because we've been through this many times before. So, <clears throat> but really, this is the once again the Deva portions of the Vrijabhasis who he took to Vaikuntha, while there at Braj, when everything became unmanifest, because not the Dushoda had so we 
return home. Well, in Braj, they continued in the Apagat Leela as if none of this disturbance had ever occurred. So therefore, Nanda Jashoda departed this world by boarding Daruka's chariot with the rest of the Brijabhasis returned to the spiritual world. But how can you return to the spiritual world from Vrindavan? In Vrindavan, the Prakatlila simply dissolved at that point and Nanda Jashoda lived. as if they never experienced a sojourn of coming to the material world. They just continued living in the uppercut dimension, as if simultaneously in Dharma's chariot with Krishna, we turn to the spiritual sky. So for the bridge of Rossi's, it was so much, it wasn't traumatic at all. It was actually a very jubilant festival of returning home while simultaneously never leaving home. Bodies. They had, they were in spiritual bodies. So, nice to see you back again. Thank you for coming. Raj, this is amazing katha you've done today. So, can you say it's the truth also applies to Srimati Radharani, her associates, gopis and manjuris? They, they, they got transferred to Aprakat Leela. Well, there again, you know, we think in linear time. <laughs> Krishna Leela doesn't fit that paradigm. So while all the gopis who were on darkest chariot returning to the spiritual world, from the spiritual world, you know, simultaneously it is Sri Dhamma's curse. Shrimati would experience a degree of separation from Krishna. So on the hundredth day of the separation, she's hearing her girlfriend, Chandranana, singing the glories of various holy places. And Chandranana was describing Sudashra. And for some reason, Srimati Radharani became very interested in Sri Stidashram. She asked, what are the benefits of bathing in that holy lake, the lake there? And Chandramana, you know, a little reluctant, he said, the benefits of bathing in that lake is you'll never again have to experience separation from Krishna. So after a hundred years of just the anguish of separation, for the first time she really like came back to life and we're going. And so, you know, we've already been to Dwarka. You know, we can go a little farther to Siddhashra. So immediately they began packing, you know, clothes and boga and utensils and made a care of that. Like a long ribbon of colorful hope traversing the countryside as they proceeded to Sinashra. Anyways, <laughs> of course, simultaneously Krishna told the Jadus, let's go to Sinashra. Okay. So when the Jadus arrived, you know, riding on their elephants and chariots, very proud. 
and it was a roadblock, these little girls. I just disregarded them, you know, plow right through. But somehow or other, they couldn't. The elephants, the horses, and the Jadu warriors could not penetrate that blockade of little girls. And they were frustrated. But their queens were thinking, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is interesting. So they asked what's going on. Well, well the queen is bathing now, so nobody can approach the lake. So then they heard the clearly understood the queen of Rudge is here. So hearing that, you know, Rukmini became so glorified the gopis. And then Satyabhama started talking you know, wildly, like, no, are they, they're not the only beautiful ones in creation. Anyway, it's a long series of events. <clears throat> but ultimately, the gopis, when Krishna left, they entered the sacred waters of Sadashram and consigned their pure spiritual forms to the waters of that lake. And that is why we decorate our bodies with tilak as we're chanting the holy names to be imbued the gopis of feelings of separation to enhance our chanting with the inspiration to follow in their own footsteps. But you know, all these things are going on simultaneously and cyclically. And, you know, you can, you can put linear time frames, but it's just so inadequate to reveal the polydimensional truths of unfolding in different dimensions. Any other questions, comments, requests? Mark, um, we had this little discussion this morning. Maybe you can say why Krishna did not kill Kaliya. By the way, there is a photo. There is a <laughs> it's the original. Original well, painting of Krishna dancing on Kaliya above you. That question is usually accompanied. Why did they banish him from Braja? Right. That's okay. The first answer is he didn't kill Kaliya because he was protected by the the prayers of his wives. The Nagapanis were pure devotees. They were appealing to Krishna on behalf of their husband. Krishna took their, prayer, their prayers to heart and spared him. Second question, even after that, why did they banish him? And, uh, and the reason was he committed a lot of offenses, which disqualified him from residence in What were his offenses? He killed all the gopas. Well, and then Krishna brought them back to life. Huh? Still, he took a quick seat. I mean, polluted Jamana, killed the gopas. Caused so much anxiety to want to just shut up. Where did he? Uh, there's two. I heard two different stories about where Kaliya went. Can you clarify? Fiji. Where? Fiji. Fiji. Okay. So you could say that Krishna wanted a temple in Fiji, <laughs> or he became the presiding deity. Yes. Um, there's a. I don't know if this is a version that I have also heard. But although he was banished away from Raj, he was also told that while you're leaving Raj, you know, if you want to stay in your body and just be free, then don't turn around and look at Raj. And 
due to the intense separation of Raj, even he felt it. He at one point after crossing Chhatikara, he turned around and that curse came true and he became a stone. So even today we have Kaliya in the form of a stone in a place called Jet, J-Y-E-T. Most of our Kanti Malas are made in that little village in Raj. And that's where they have a beautiful temple that next time if everybody gets an opportunity, do visit Jet. So instead of going straight to Radhakund, you need to make a right turn on the main highway and ask the rickshawala or the taxi, take me to Jet. And there we find that the ancient uh, curse that was there on him when he turned around, we still see that he's in the stone form, frozen. So uh, maybe if you can elaborate a little bit more. Well, there's another part of that pastime too, because <coughs> Krishna told him that uh, I mean, it is a response to Kaliya's prayer that if you ever need a ride anywhere, you know, maybe your wound is tied up or something, just call on me. I'll be there in a blink of an eye. And sometimes Krishna takes him up on that offer. Because in some cultures, Krishna rides into Kamsa's arena, riding on Kaliya. <laughs> So, he was banished, but he does get to come back and serve as Krishna's carrier. Since you mentioned Srila Vishwanath Chakrati Thakur, there is a very nice explanation that Shila Krishna Tadirupad gives of why Kaliya was not killed by Krishna, along with, of course, the reason is the pure bhakti of the Nagapatnis. But what was his age uh, at that time when the Kaliya Daban happened? About six, seven? Something like that. Something like that. Yeah. So our Krishna Tadirupad is saying that while he was dancing on the hoods of Kaliya, all the Vrajvasis that gathered, the Vatsalya Ras, parental devotees, including Nanda Baba, Yeshara Mai, the Sakyaras devotees were there, and also the little gopis were there, including Srimati Radharani. And Krishna wanted to show the gopis that I am that wonderful dancer, impress them. And it was, it is said to Vishwanath Bhat mentioned that uh, the real Madhuri Rasa period started there. Where, you know, like how we go to school and college and how the boys want to impress the girls. So, uh, that's one of the, and, and Kalya played an important role in it to enhance that Madhuri Rasa. Yeah, well, that event really took off with a bang, so to speak. <laughs> because everyone was so mesmerized seeing Krishna dancing on Kaliya's hoods. So Krishna extended his hand and took the gopis up with him. And they started having Rasa Leela. But this was a really dynamic Rasa Leela because, you know, he has not, you know, many, many hoods. They're all rising and falling and swaying. And so they're having Rasa Leela on all these different stages as Kalia is swimming on, on like a, he, he transformed like a, what do you call them, those special ships, luxury liner. <laughs> Kalia, he became like the ultimate luxury liner hosting a Rasa Lila on his many stages all moving and swaying and rising and descending as they go on the pleasure cruise. 
visiting different islands of Jamuna. Wow. Okay, well that's a very significant picture. Yes. Actually, Kalia's wives were disgusted with her. But they continued to pray for her. So, when they're you know, watching, as you know, the venom and the poisons and the vapors are just they were completely extracted. And then he began vomiting blood, which means his life. All the poisons were already extracted by that touch of Krishna's feet. And now he's vomiting blood, which means he's given up his life. But what the Nagapati saw that at that point he was becoming very repentant. What does repentance mean? It's not like John the Baptist running around. Repent, repent. And just aggravating everybody to such an extent that they finally get away with it. No, it means just change your attitude. So they saw that he's, he's repentant. He, he's turning to Krishna. He's looking upon him with so much affection and total dependence as his only shelter. So, you know, the Nagapadis have been praying for his deliverance all along, but when they saw that transition in his heart, then their prayers changed a little. They said, look, Krishna, he's repentant. He's turning to you as his only shelter. Please consider him. But what that demonstrates, practically speaking, for all of us, is the power in the prayers of the Vaishnavas. And the extreme potency protection that has to offer us. Because really, we're all like the Lucullios. Because what part of the human body is most like a servant? Most inspired to lash out with venom and poison is the tongue. We all have one. And has the potential to be just like Kaleo. So where's our shelter? Keeping the holy name dancing upon our tongues, just like Krishna dancing on the hoods of Kaleo. And then you see what happens all the poison, all the venom, the Lust, anger, greed, pride, illusion, it all comes surging forward and they're just shocked. I didn't even know I had that in me. Better out than in. <clears throat> and, and just keep Christian dancing on your tongue until it's all purified and all dissipated. And what's left? The pure nature of the soul. Love and devotion and service to Krishna. So this pastime is very relevant to all of us. <laughs> Keep Krishna always dancing upon the table. And request the prayers of the Vaishnavas for additional support as well. Okay? Anything else? Maharaj, the, you mentioned, you said that hearing is not enough, we need to assimilate. Is the assimilation different than application? I would imagine it is somewhat different. It's very intimately related. You can't apply unless you assimilate. 
but a tremendous inspiration to assimilate is deciding to apply. So what does assimilation mean? It becomes part of you. Um, <clears throat> you know, simply hearing philosophy doesn't do you much if any good if you don't have the intention to apply it. You can't apply it unless you first assimilate it. And, you know, the, the narrative is telling his own story. It's very brief and sweet and simple and profoundly significant. It's, it's so amazing. And she hosted the Bhaktivedantas, the, the sages. And he assisted her. And in his own words, he explains, even though I was just a young boy, that I was very sober, respectful, and I wouldn't even take their remnants without their permission. And see in my demeanor, they blessed me to assimilate all we had heard. So you can't apply without assimilating. And to assimilate, we're also dependent on those blessings. But most of all, our own behavior. We act like Vaishnavas so that we can assimilate the national protocol and apply it in our lives. You know, the physical ear conveys information to your mind. The spiritual ear conveys, or it opens your heart to transcendental knowledge. And the ideal is to integrate your mind to knowledge. But it requires you know, certain behavior, certain protocol, certain disciplines, certain etiquette. Otherwise, you know, the blessings and the instructions just they stay on a superficial level. You know, maybe you'll learn the philosophy with your mind and intellect, but it's not going to do you much good if you don't assimilate it in your heart and demonstrate it in your behavior your conduct, your discipline. Without discipline, you don't go anywhere in life. Discipline is the bridge between aspirations and goals. All right? Place of Lord Balaram. I know last year you talked all about Lord Balaram. Thank you very much. Shiva Prabhupada. Thank you for taking me.